Well, we're continuing our series on the nurturing of kids' emotional and mental health um, through reading, especially when it comes to representation and inclusion. And today we feature the newest young adult book from the award winning author Riley Redgate titled Alone Out There, which poses the question to its readers, where do you stand when you are one of the last ones standing? So with me right now is the author herself, Midwest, um, from the Midwest right up the road, Riley Redgate. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Now, um, Alone Out There has been described as Lord of the Flies in space. Is that yeah. an accurate description? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty accurate, I'd say. Um, should I give you a little synopsis? Just Absolutely. To Go ahead and let us know what it's about and what our readers can expect. Yeah, so um, Alone Out Here is set in 2072. Um, it is... Uh, in kind of the shadow of a forthcoming climate disaster that will be triggered by a volcanic eruption. Um, so in the uh, in anticipation of this disaster, the world's leaders, scientists, engineers have been rallying together to try and build a space fleet um, that will get a certain percentage of humanity off of the Earth alive. Um, so one of these ships has been finished and kids are touring it uh, as a group of kids, as they're going on a tour of this prototype spaceship. Um, and while they're taking their tour, this volcanic eruption happens um, many months ahead of when it was forecasted to. So these kids are the only ones to make it off of the planet alive and must then grapple with the knowledge that they are kind of the last bastion of, of humankind. Um, so yeah, it's a struggle to try and rebuild a society and the question of whether they'll be able to do that or whether they will inherit their parents' mistakes. Oh, wow, that does sound enlightening and, and indeed and exciting to read. Now, uh, we know that there are some kind of similar things that are happening right now in our world today, especially when it comes to, you know, the younger generation and mm -hmm. um, that urge for youth to, you know, take the lead, as you said. And um, the question remains, you know, what type of lead do you take? Do you take um, a new stance or do you go with the stance of your parents? And it seems like your book alone out there is one of those um, books that you, uh, that kids can get some insight from as to, you know, how to handle things in even today's world. Would you say that's yeah. correct as well? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, it's definitely a book that explores the feeling that you are, are kind of independently responsible for the future of the world. Yeah. I think it's a really tough situation that like Gen Z right now has been put in um, and you know we millennials were sort of put in the same position before then where it was like how are you going to fix these mistakes that have that have arisen? How are you going to fix for instance the climate crisis? How are you going to fix gun violence in schools? And kind of the thing is like it shouldn't be on kids to fix these things and I think it's damaging to expect children to be able to um, and kind of the but the the kids in the book are struggling with these feelings of helplessness where mm -hmm. like they realize that that it's up to them to try and rebuild a, a better society but they still somehow feel as if that is out of their hands um, even when suddenly they have like a little bit of control in their lives it's it's still like this struggle to, to take steps forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think like in actual life, it can be really frustrating like for kids as well as many adults because we would like to believe that we live in this sort of individually powered society where we as individuals, if we care so much about the environment or if we care so much about these issues that are plaguing society, then we can go and do something about it. But the issue is that a lot of these, these you know, these things are in, like held in institutional power and are inaccessible to us as individuals. So like, how do we deal with those feelings of like wanting to make things better, but feeling as if that's inaccessible to us? Um, I think that's definitely a big part of this 
this book's questions. Yeah, exactly. And, then, and that applies on any scale. So um, not even just, you know, the larger skills of climate change, but also those smaller skills, you know, um, those kids with the, you know, aging parents, you know, how do you navigate that? Or, you know, if you have younger siblings and, you know, you, you're kind of looked at to help out, you know, with that, like you said, it's those emotional um, those that emotional health and how do you navigate those feelings is, is very important right. and I, I appreciate your book for addressing that too and helping kids with that yeah. now um, in, in in its own way you know they can take what's in there and apply it to what they're they have going on in their own lives as well mm-hmm. now um, Riley Ridgate is your pen name um, why did you mm-hmm. choose a pseudonym and how did you come up with the name Riley Redgate? Yeah, so the um, my legal name is very Irish and has a uh, silent GH in the middle of it, um, and approximately no one who isn't in Ireland has ever been able to look at my first name and be like, I know exactly how that's pronounced. Uh. <laughs> um, so I wanted something that would be, you know, a little bit more approachable and, and readable. Um, I chose the pen name when I was around 16 on a writer's forum, um, and... Yeah, I kept my initials because I wanted to have some vestige of of the the real name left in there. Um, but yeah, I definitely I wanted something that was, you know, would be easily kind of more memorable than my legit name. Although I will say, as I'm aging, I'm starting to care a lot less about that. And I'm <laughs> like, maybe if you know, maybe if I write adult books, I'll I'll just use my my actual name. Um, well, I definitely understand that, and I love your pen name, so um, I think you should keep it. <laughs> I think you should keep it. It's great. Now, um, in regards to your name, um, as you say, your heritage spans two cultures, which Irish, like you mentioned, and Chinese. Um, how has growing up in that mixed race influenced your writing? Yeah, I think um. Yeah, so it's definitely a bit of an odd intersection. My my dad is Irish, my mom is Malaysian Chinese, and um, I am American. Like I, in terms of heritage, yeah, half half Chinese and half Irish. Um, I was born in Ohio, raised in North Carolina, um, and am you know if I were to go to Ireland or Malaysia, I would be the American. Um, mm-hmm. So I think like having that sort of intersection of identities like maybe it makes me more interested in issues of inclusion and representation maybe it makes me more interested in uh stories that are more international in scope this this book has an international cast um so it's yeah i but at the same time i hesitate to ascribe those interests purely to that like i i know a lot of folks like who are you know who have just American heritage and have no connection to these things and still are curious about the world and its inhabitants and about inclusivity and I think that's a good thing. I don't think these things should solely be determined because of, you know, what whatever background we personally have. Of course. Absolutely, exactly. And um, you mentioned the uh, multinational cast of characters in your book, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, leads right to the point that you just mentioned. Um, but why do you think that inclusivity and representation are so important in young adult fiction? Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying anything like groundbreaking here, but I do think that like, it is damaging to grow up and only identify with people who don't, um, in some way, kind of resemble your own experiences. Um, I like, I don't know, it's when there are so many problems and issues in the world, I think um, it's easy to look at these sorts of things that happen in fictional spheres and be like, well, that's silly. But of course I believe that art matters and that art reaches out and connects people and that it creates kind of an empathic link between, between folks. Um, And it like affected me really deeply when I first started to read books that had, um, you know, like Asian American characters who were experiencing maybe some of the same questions or feelings that I had growing up. Um, And I didn't really have those kinds of stories when I was a teenager. I think things are a lot better now. Um, I think, yeah, there's a, a lot, a lot more breadth of of diversity now in in publishing and in 
um, I think maybe also film as well, um, which is heartening. I do think that like, you know, it's, it's valuable to see your, to look in and, and see that, you know, it's not only, um, not only boys or not only like white kids who can like go on fun adventures or like ask interesting psychological questions or yeah, these, these are not things that are exclusive to anyone of any, any group. Um, Absolutely. And you're contributing to that. I'm not, how does that feel to know that you're contributing to that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, it's kind of strange. I think like it can feel almost like, I mean, my second book, Noteworthy, um, is, it has a Chinese American lead and that was the first time I had really ever written a Chinese American lead. And to me, it felt very natural to write her. And so in my mind, it was almost like invisible. I was just like, oh yeah, this main character is just Chinese because you know, no reason. It's not like it has, it's not like it's about Chinese identity. It's like a, a like a mistaken identity rom-com. Um, it's not about being like Asian. And so to me, like, and it was sort of a background element, but then I have like heard from readers who were like, it meant so much to me that this character was specifically Chinese American. And I was like, oh yes, that's right. Because it meant things to me when I began to see that as well. And yet in my head, it wasn't as meaningful when it was coming from me, but it is, it's strange to see that feeling echoed back to you from other places unexpectedly. Um, Absolutely. And you're, you're making an impact just all over, not only, you know, nationally, but globally as well. So yes, your work, your work is, <laughs> you're, you, you know, just to be a part of that, I'm, I'm pretty sure, like you said, it feels really, um, you know, kind of, you don't really think of it, but it's amazing as well. Um, <laughs> now, talk about your, uh, when you mentioned your youth, um, you did publish your first novel before you even graduated college. And mm -hmm. like you said, this is your fourth young adult novel. Um, mm -hmm. What's like most about writing for that particular age group? And um, yeah. what helped you, what inspired you to write for that particular age group? Yeah, I think in the beginning, it was very much like, you know, I started drafting that first debut book before I left high school. So I started writing it in senior year of high school. So that was very much a like, you know, write what you know situation. Like I'm a teenager, I don't feel qualified to, you know, necessarily make those huge leaps. Um, that was kind of what it was back then. Um, my lingering feeling toward it is that I, I, I remember being a teen reader and I remember being so emotionally involved in the books that I read at that time and so immersed in them and I, the idea of like writing for readers, um, an audience who can kind of like take on a book in that way and, and have that level of like enthusiasm and immersion is very exciting still. Um, but yeah, I... I'm open to uh, writing other um, for other age groups. Of course, I'm I'm looking at maybe doing something a little bit younger, kind of in the middle grade space. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I um, I have a few like adult projects that I'm working on um, that maybe we'll someday see the light of day. Um, so yeah. Awesome, awesome. Now um, about the book alone out there and we've discussed a couple of the things what are some of the key takeaways that you would like readers to um, come back from after reading this book yeah takeaways interesting question I so the book does have a lot of these kind of larger moral questions and what it takes to build like a good society with good institutions and, and stuff like that but I think kind of in terms of like especially for younger readers, I think maybe one of the biggest elements in, in my mind would be the fact that the, so the main character is the first daughter. She's the president's daughter. And so she has kind of lived in this media spotlight her whole life and has learned to sort of shut away her own thoughts and opinions because she's worried constantly that they will be used against her. Um, and in kind of creating a character like that, I sort of drew on these sort of like internet e feelings of, of permanence and exposure where I think a lot of 
people, especially young people, but not exclusively young people, have these feelings of constantly being put under a spotlight and, mm -hmm. and feeling worried that they're somehow doing the wrong thing and that they've somehow transgressed. And that can be anxiety inducing, it can be kind of paralyzing. Mm -hmm. And so the main character of this book in a lot of ways is processing that and learning how to express what she stands for and what she feels and that it's okay to take hard stances and it's okay to be disliked because that means that you have chosen who you are. Um, so that would be, I think, probably the, the biggest thing in terms of takeaways in, in my mind. I love that though. That's excellent. And um, lastly, we talked about what you would like readers to take away from the book. Um, what type of advice, if you could give one piece of advice to young adult readers right now, um, to that age group, what would you like to give them? What advice would you like to give them? Hmm, a piece of advice, I think, hmm, to young readers. Um, I'd say it's, um, it, it's okay not to know yet. I think, like, there's a lot of pressure to seem like you know everything. Oh, yeah. And to seem like you always have, like, you know, this kind of comes back to the feelings of anxiety and exposure mm -hmm. thing, but to, to seem like you have it all figured out and to seem like you have already formed all of these perfect opinions and that you are like you know that you came into the world this perfect fully formed person mm -hmm. I, I think it's okay to respond to any given question i don't know um i don't know enough yet i i would like to do more reading on the topic i would like to you know spend more time thinking about x like you don't have to know everything right now and it's unreasonable if somebody expects you to. Um, yeah. That is the most inspiring and, and empowering piece of advice that I have ever heard for young people <laughs> right now. So thank you so much for that. That was wonderful. And we want to let everyone know um, to go ahead and pick up a copy of Alone Out Here by Riley Redgate. You can get it anywhere that um, digital or hard copy books are sold. And um, be sure to check out Riley Redgate and hope she's going to tell us right now where you can follow her, keep up with the yeah. latest that she'll be doing online. So let us know where people can keep up to date with you and in, in everything that you're doing. For sure. I, I have a website. It's uh, not updated as frequently as it should be, but I'll, I'll get to that in a bit. Um, it's RileyRedgate.com. And then I'm also on Instagram at Riley Redgate, and that's probably the easiest social media to, to, to find me on. Um, perfect, perfect. So um, again, that's RileyRedgate.com. Um, definitely pick up the book. You will not regret it. Um, for parents out there, purchase that book for your young children. They will love it. Give them some inspiration, encouragement, and empowerment in their lives about their emotional health and well-being and how to navigate things that are going on today in their own lives in a fun and creative way way um, with that science fiction novel. So thank you so much for joining me today, Riley. It's been a pleasure and thank you for all that you've done and we wish you the best of luck in your future activities and events. All right, thank you.